What is going on? Welcome to the podcast. And in today's episode, I have Sahil Bloom. And Sahil is an investor. He runs a VC fund. He also writes incredible threads on Twitter. And in this particular podcast, I want to uh, dive deep into what makes Sahil tick. So we talk about everything from uh, giving up a grand a grand slam to get into the World Series of college baseball and uh, his lessons around that. Uh, we talk about his training regime. Uh, we also uh, go into his systems around uh, business, parenting, and also his marriage. And one of the things that really strikes me about this uh, conversation that I had with Sahil is that he just thinks incredibly deeply about uh, every single aspect of his life. And one of the things that uh, I really admire about him is the fact that he has no ceilings and no compensations on the things that matter to him. So, which are his business, his family, and also uh, the people that he loves. Uh, he runs a hundred with all of them. And and again, like I, I live this life where I don't believe there are any ceilings to what you can accomplish. I, I do believe that there are sometimes trade-offs, but at the same time, it is more so a commitment to being excellent at the things that matter. Uh, and the things that matter are, are basically your health, uh, your relationships, and also your wealth. So in this particular podcast interview, it's one of my uh, favorite conversations that I've had. We also get into some rapid fire questions that we had from uh, some of my homies on Twitter. And uh, without further ado, here is the interview with Sahil Bloom. Sahil, nice to meet you. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing, my man? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here, man. Yeah. Um, so uh, I want to start uh, this podcast uh, at Florida State. And oh, geez. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just had the highlight uh, of your career, saving the game uh, to get your team into the regionals or the super regionals. Uh, and then in the next game, uh, with a trip to the College World Series on the line and with your friends and family watching, you give up the game-winning grand slam and when that happened what was going through your mind at that time <laughs> yeah you're bringing me back Tallahassee's not my favorite place uh in, in the world I don't know that I'll ever go back no no knock on Tallahassee and I think they actually they have a great uh they have a great fan base and um you know people that really love baseball and cheer on their home team so it's not a knock on them just not my favorite uh place in the world as a result of this but yeah I mean my um I mean my immediate reaction is like it's a metaphor for life broadly when, when bad stuff happens uh you know you can have all the like wisdom in the world and all sorts of like you know adages you've read about oh just trust that it's darkest before the dawn and all the cliches that we read but the reality is when like bad shit happens it just sucks like there's no um you know smile through it like you know grind through chaos whatever it's just like the bad thing happened and it's the worst feeling in the world and i remember that like that that was what i remember feeling was just um, you know, and it wasn't a personal feeling. It's a team sport. And I always felt this deep, deep connection to my team. And I, I had been a big part of helping us get there. And I really just felt this tremendous disappointment uh, in what I felt like was letting my team down um, through that performance. And um, I felt that towards my coaches, I felt that towards my teammates. And that was the worst part of it was just like, it wasn't, oh, I just did this on a grand stage and people saw it and people are laughing at me. Like I, you don't really think about that as much for me. It was just this visceral pain of letting your entire team down. There's 35 guys on the team and you feel like you're the one guy that let them down. Um, so that's really what I remember. I also, I mean, you know, just reflecting on it shortly thereafter, I remember having this weird sensation of the ups and downs of life, because as you said, you know, literally a week before that, I think that was on a Saturday night that that Grand Slam happened. I think a week before um, I had closed the regional championship game and gotten the last out of this big game. It was like, you know, my dad was in the stands watching, you know, like 10,000 fans. It was incredible, like the highest high I could imagine in life. And then to this point, a week later, the lowest low and, you know, privileged thing to say lowest low is like this baseball moment. But at the time in my life, it really was. Uh, and I just remember having this sensation of like, wow, that is in a short period of time, you got the full feeling of the waves of how life can swing. Um, and in reflecting on it later, you realize, okay, there's a lesson in there of like, 
don't get too high. I probably got too high on myself after the good one and thought that I was like King Kong out there and could do anything. And also don't get too low because, you know, the, you have to go out and get the next guy out. And so, like, I gave up that grand slam. I actually what I'm most proud of is I then got the next two guys out to get out of the inning um, and kind of wrap it there. And, you know, I didn't just fold and walk away from the whole thing. I don't talk about that, but that was the real moral of the story. And it was what my parents pointed to later was like, that's what you should be proud of was, you know, this terrible thing happened and you didn't just, you know, crumble and walk away from the situation. You picked yourself up and you got the next two guys out. Dope. Uh, and, uh, you mentioned something before, uh, that you actually took a summer off after the, after the, uh, super regionals, uh, you told your coach, I'm, I'm not going to do any practice. I'm not going to go any baseball. What was the, uh, what was the philosophy behind taking a summer off? And what did you kind of learn during that, taking that time away from the game a little bit? Yeah, I think there are two things. I mean, number one, um, <clears throat> sometimes you just need to take a breather. Like I, I'm a big believer in like when, when you're in a bad situation, I think Warren Buffett said this, like the, uh, when you find yourself at the bottom of the hole, the first thing that you have to do is just stop digging. Um, and I've really internalized that over my life because I always found when I reflected on bad situations I've got into, um, my natural bias is to create motion. I want to just start moving. I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, maybe if I do this and then this will happen and this. And the reality when I reflect on it is that most of the time creating a bunch of additional motion when you're in a bad situation actually makes it worse. And so what you need to learn to do and what I found um, really important in my life and in that instance in particular is like you're in a bad situation it, mentally, physically, uh, work, whatever it is. Sometimes you just need to step away. And whether that's for like five minutes, you just walk away from your computer and gather yourself, completely separate your mind. Or in that case, it was a summer where I had just created this super negative emotion and mental connection with baseball. Um, and I didn't want to play. Like I was going to have to go get on a plane, fly. I was going to the Cape Cod League that summer, which is this pinnacle of college baseball. And the idea of going back into a bunch more stressful baseball situations when I was feeling that way mentally, I was just a hard pass on that. And so that was kind of the genesis of it was like, no, I'm just going to take a step back from this and walk away for a little bit, not think about baseball for like the first time in my life, really, for an extended period of time. Um, and that was important to me. I, the other piece, candidly, was like I had never had a real job uh, until that point in my life. I'd pumped gas, you know, as my first job when I was a kid and done that for several summers, but I didn't have an intellectual job yet. Um, and I knew I needed to do that if I wanted to then work after my final year at Stanford. And so um, it was kind of a cool opportunity to both separate myself from baseball mentally, and then also go and hopefully get some experience that would impact, you know, whatever I ended up doing post baseball career. Nice, nice. And then what was, uh, what was the biggest lesson for you just uh, stepping back? Was that just like, you got to get a real job? Or was it to uh, kind of like uh, con uh, contemplate your future. Uh, what is the lesson that you took away from from that entire experience? I think probably the biggest thing was just realizing that baseball didn't define me. Uh, well, you know, one of the hardest things in life for anyone is transitions. Uh, you know, you have these transitions that happen. And generally speaking, those transitions are most challenging when they're your own internal definition of yourself. So what I mean by that is like my whole life, from the time I was in Little League, I had basically defined myself as a baseball player. Um, I was good at school and I did well and um, or did well enough to, you know, continue to move forward and get into a good school. But the reality was I thought of myself as a baseball player. I thought I would go play professional baseball. I thought I would, you know, be famous playing baseball. Like that was that was how I defined myself. And that was then my perception of how other people defined me. And I thought my parents thought of me as a baseball player and all my friends thought of me as a baseball player. And so the scariest thing is like, what happens when that transition, when you're not a baseball player anymore? Yeah. Um, and so for me, that summer was an integral part of distancing myself from that self-definition and realizing that I was actually a lot more, that I had, you know, this whole other side to me mentally, emotionally, um, physically, you know, training in a different way that wasn't baseball. Uh, and that really unlocked me. Uh, and for a lot of my friends and a lot of people, um, who've had that transition from a baseball standpoint later in life, it's very, very challenging. And so I've, I've talked to a bunch of people about this of like, how do we make that transition for athletes in particular easier? Because it tends to be really difficult. You just, you know, I remember like when I finally had to retire, I'd hurt my shoulder and it's about a year after all of this. And the hardest conversation was calling my dad 
to let him know that I wasn't going to play anymore and that I, you know, I couldn't do it. Like literally physically, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and for some reason in my mind, I was like, he's going to be so disappointed in me because we've had this bond that's been built around baseball. And the reality was like, he didn't give a shit. He loved me for who I was. And he knew that I was going to go do amazing things, whatever it was after the field. Um, but we build up this barrier in our own minds that this is the only way we can be defined. Um, and so for me personally, I mean, taking that step away and forcing that time and that separation, it allowed me to kind of make that transition much more uh, seamless. Amazing, because I feel uh, even right now, uh, as entrepreneurs, uh, as parents, or we, we tend to identify ourselves with being this thing, when the reality is, is that uh, we are much deeper than just being one thing. Um, how would you go about defining yourself right now? Or if, would you even define yourself as anything right now? Yeah, you know, it's interesting what you hit on there, because the uh, my, my uh, perspective, the reason that is that we define ourselves as one thing is because society wants you to be fit into the like single sentence at a cocktail party. Mm. And I thought about this a lot when I was making my own life transition out of my first job to my, you know, what I'm doing now. I always like, you know, I took a job straight out of school at a private equity fund. I was there for seven years. I was rising through the ranks. I was like on the partner track, you know, everything was hunky dory, but I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a fit for me and my energy and what I was going to do. And I didn't want to wake up in 20 years and think that that was what I did with my life because I didn't find a ton of energy from it. You get one shot and I wanted to really enjoy what I was doing. Um, but my biggest fear was that I wasn't going to have that one sentence uh, you know, when you go to a cocktail party, you go to an event, people are like, what do you do? And I used to say, oh, I'm a vice president at, you know, X firm. And, uh, you know, I, I work on investments in the consumer industry, whatever it was. Um, super easy to say, nice, neatly packaged, sounds impressive. People go, oh, wow, cool. Ask you more questions about it. And my biggest fear with the transition was like, what am I going to say I do? People asked me, you know, and even as I was making that transition, people would say like, what do you do? And I would struggle with it and feel really uncomfortable and be like, ooh, that was weird. I didn't like that. Even my wife would be like, you need to come up with a better way of saying that. It makes it seem like you do nothing. Um, and that's like a that's a real tension. And it's a stupid thing. But I think because of that fear, we end up wanting to just have the nice, neatly packaged thing. It's easier to just say, oh, I've worked for 20 years at IBM or whatever it is because it's the one line. Um, so transitioning back to your point and your your your, your question um, how do I define what I do today? I try not to actually, um, because I've tried to just like reject the notion of needing to, uh, you know, define what I do in one sentence. I guess, you know, I'm an investor. Uh, you know, I, I would say I kind of run like a media holding company of sorts um, that has an investment arm. So I don't consider myself a VC. We joked about that on Twitter. Yeah. Like, you know, yes. I think people would want to call me a VC maybe because I have a small fund, but I don't define myself as a VC by any means. And when people like call me that, uh, you know, in like trash talk against VCs and I get bucketed into that, I think it's funny because I don't consider myself a VC. I don't really consider myself like a writer either. It's just, um, you know, I'm doing what gives me energy on a daily basis and I'm hopefully impacting a lot of people. Um, but I'm trying to like actively reject that cocktail party sentence culture that I feel like we've, uh, we've created. So what do you say to people when they ask you, what do you do when you meet a new person? I think I use something different every single time. I actually, this is a funny side story. We, um, so I, I used to, uh, I spent a ton of time with baseball players and in the off seasons, uh, you know, over winter break, I'd go home from Stanford and I had this crew of friends who was playing professional baseball. They would all come up to this, um, this place called Cressy performance in the Boston area. That was like the Mecca of college and professional baseball. I trained there my whole life. I was Eric Cressy's first client. Um, and, you know, became a close, close friend. So we had this group of like amazing, fun, loving friends. We'd all go out in Boston and there was this game people would play when they were trying to talk to girls. And the whole game was, can you like, you know, strike up a conversation with a girl without saying that you're a professional baseball player? And so, you know, cause that felt like an advantage to like, oh, I'm a cool athlete, whatever. And so guys would come up with the most absurd, you know, self definitions for what they did. And it was just, it was totally made up. Like guys would say they were like janitors or they were, you know, Oh, like I, I work at a mop making company, you know, like just the most random things. So I, I don't do that. That's a total aside. Um, I guess I would say I'm like, you know, I think the easiest way for me to say it is that I run a venture fund. Um, and, uh, 
and create. You know, I'm a kind of content creator and investor. I think that's probably the easiest way to say it. Um, but the content creation thing is funny to me because I, I, um, I don't really consider that work. Like I love sharing. I love impacting. Hopefully, uh, you know, a few people uh, that I that I interact with. But I don't really consider the writing part of my work. Um, I guess my newsletter has, you know, sponsors and stuff now. So it's kind of a business or the podcast has sponsors. So it's a business. Um, but all of that, I just consider fun. I'm like, wow, I get to write and share something that I've been thinking about, or I get to record a conversation with someone really interesting and learn something from it. And someone's going to pay me for that. Like, that seems crazy to me. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, uh, to be totally honest, I still really struggle with it. I have no clue how to define what I do or, or what to say that I am. I agree. And I, I, when people ask me, I'm just like, I, I've got no idea. Uh, there's so many things, so many things. And you mentioned an OG name in the fitness industry. His name is Eric Cressy. I'm a huge fan of Eric. Uh, he's actually one of uh, the first people I looked up to when I was starting in the fitness industry. Um, and if anyone doesn't know Eric Cressy, he runs uh, – he runs Cressy Performance, and uh, it is, it's literally pumping out some of the best baseball players on the planet right now. Um, and also, uh, when it comes to strength and conditioning, Eric is actually at the forefront of, uh, of what actually works. So I want to ask you, what are some of the best training principles that you learned from uh, training at Cressy Performance? And also, if you can tell us like kind of like what your training regime looks like right now, because I'm a bit jealous. I'm not going to lie. I uh, saw the 400-pound deadlift with chains, and I was just like, God damn it. I'm a fitness guy and he's deadlifting more than me right now. This is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so. I can't quite pull it like I used to, man. I was a lot bigger back in the day. No. Yeah. I mean, I met Eric. <clears throat> I was a 16 year old. Um, it was summer after my sophomore year of high school. I was 16. I was probably about like six feet tall and like just skinny fat. Like I was just pudgy, unathletic, um and eric still somewhere black will blackmail me with this in the future because he has pictures of me from my like first evaluation with him that are not flattering and like videos of my attempt at broad jumping that are hilariously <laughs> unathletic um you know but I, I trained with him for as i was playing baseball for the period from when i was 16 until i was you know 23 um and we've remained really close um you know he's been a close friend and mentor and was at my wedding and um super super close with his family but you know look the <clears throat> the principles of training that I learned paled in comparison in comparison to the principles of life that I learned being there. Um, I was 16 and starting to train, you know, as they grew around a bunch of these professional athletes who were coming in and out. And I got to really learn and observe from being around people that were the best in the world at their craft and see uh, in real time the consistency, the intensity, the attitude that they brought on a daily basis uh, and really forge my own in that way. And, you know, I became maniacal about my training and nutrition. Um, and it leveled me up in so many ways in life. You know, obviously baseball, I felt like I made the most of the talent that I have, which honestly, I think I was talented, but probably not very talented. And I think I made the most of it. Um, but more importantly, the things I learned from a consistency standpoint of showing up every day of punching the clock of creating intensity in your own mind and creating like a mental gym, um, that has applied to everything that I do. And so when I see myself now or when people see me and say like, well, wow, you're really consistent with putting out content or doing whatever you do. Well, it's like, shit, yeah, man. I mean, that's the same things I learned and that's all I know. I'm never going to be any different. I'm not going to be the guy that just like shows up once and then disappears for forever. You're just going to see me over and over again. It might not be the flashiest or the most talented and it might not be the 99 mile an hour fastball, but I'm just going to keep coming at you and just mm -hmm. keep getting up over and over again. And you're going to have a really, really tough time beating me because of that. Uh, and that's just the mentality that I feel like I developed from being around him. From a specific training standpoint, I mean, Eric was always big on the basics. Uh, and I love that as a broader mentality on life too. I mean, we learned how to deadlift. We learned how to hip hinge really effectively, which is such an important movement. Um, we learned how to front squat really effectively. Baseball players better than putting your shoulder into the position of a back squat. Um, there was no bench pressing because pitchers, you know, we uh, didn't want to get our shoulders into that position. So I'm still kind of annoyed that my chest is tiny because of him, <laughs> uh, you know, because I didn't get to build that up early on. But well, I mean, I started deadlifting when I was 16 and fell in love with it. Um, there's just something primal about picking things up off the ground that I can't get enough of. And 
people, you know, there's the whole meme now on the internet of like deadlifting being bad for you. And, um, I don't know, I beg to differ. Um, you know, look, I think if you get into the right positions in these things, there's a lot of good that can come from them. Um, I also think it's not for everyone and I don't think everyone can get into the right positions. I think you need to focus on getting into the right positions before you should load up a deadlift. Cause you see a lot of videos of deadlifters and just say like, Oh, Holy shit. That looks, that's not going to be good. Mm. Um, so I, I think there's a lot there. I mean, the like progressive overload was always the, the kind of core, um, training philosophy around these things. Like we were trying to slowly and steadily increase the load on the, on our muscles over time. Um, And then there was a lot of like things around anti-rotation movements. Like I never did a crunch right in, I don't know, 10 years working out there, never did a crunch once, never did like anything I would define as abs. And yet I had abs throughout and still do. I I still don't do crunches. Like I haven't done any sort of crunch focused ab motion and yet I have abs. And so those were just like a couple of the things I felt like I learned from being around those guys. You are, you're speaking my language right now. I mean, especially with the anti-rotation stuff. I mean, I'm pretty sure you go into gyms right now and you just see people doing sit-ups and crunches and you're just like, whoa, that's just like an injury waiting to happen. Uh, You mentioned something very quickly, which I want to get back to, which is the mental gym. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, um, so it goes back to my, my point that I made earlier about not being particularly talented. Um, and I realized that really, I realized that the day I got to Stanford, I got there and I've talked about this before. I mean, I got there and I thought I was all, I thought I was all that. Like I was a, uh, you know, a baseball player from Massachusetts going to Stanford. So I thought I was super good at baseball. I thought I was super smart and I got to school and I realized I wasn't that smart. And I realized I wasn't that good at baseball. Um, you know, and like in a visceral way, I saw people throwing harder than me in an emotional way day one, you get to the locker room and everyone has their own locker. And there were like two or three lockers that were shared. And I was one of the shared lockers. And I remember just thinking like, damn, uh, you know, if I'm one of the shit, that means I'm in like the bottom, like six guys or whatever, if there's three of those, um, when I showed up and that was like, you know, a punch to the face and a punch to the ego. Um, and for me, I just remembered thinking like, okay, so you're not that talented, then what are you going to have to do? Because you're not just going to fail. You're not just going to like, you know, curl up into a ball and cry about it, et cetera. And so what that meant to me was that I needed to create um, these games in my mind that I was going to be playing um, and that I was just going to play the game differently. And so what I mean by that is like I would create anything I was doing, some sort of like weird challenge in my own brain that I was going to be fighting against someone. So even when there were things that were like, it was easy to just go through the motions and you could just get your little throwing in, or you could just get your little workout in and, and then leave. And people were doing that. The talented guys were doing that. Cause that was what was easy. I was creating some sort of like, no, if you don't do this, then this per, you know, then, um, you know, you're a failure. You're t- like talking trash to yourself in your head, or you're like, Oh, you have to do this better than the last time. Otherwise you're, you know, you're weak or you're soft. Like I was creating this. And, it, and honestly, it was like a lot of negative self-talk, which they tell you not to do, but it worked for me where I would just create these competitions in my own mind that no one knew were going on, but they were driving me on a daily basis to get better about things. Same thing with like waking up early. I was just going to wake up early. And if it hurt in the morning, you'd be like, you know, get like, are you really going to complain about this? Like there's people, you know, my mom is from India. I spent a lot of time there. Like there's people who have to get up so they don't starve. And you're sitting here at Stanford and you're going to say, oh, I'm tired. I'm not going to wake up to get this workout in or do this thing. Like, how lucky are you to be able to do this? There are people that would kill for this. And I would say that to myself. And honestly, my mom said that to me growing up when I would complain about things. Mm -hmm. And um, that really stuck with me. Like, anytime I would try to complain about something, my mom would say, like, how are you going to complain about this? There is an entirely different side to the world that would kill for this opportunity or this thing you're getting to do. And so it is your duty and your responsibility to take advantage of it and to make the most of it because you have this lucky, this great fortune. Um, And so I just created that in my mind. And like, that's what I say when I say mental gym, like I would just really be in my own head around these things to create these scenarios and these situations that forced me to level up over a period of time. Are you still doing like, because to me, that seems very, it seems to some people like negative. It's like you're talking to yourself in the very like disparaging way to push yourself towards a new level. Uh, now, are you still doing a form of that right now? Uh, because right now you are, you know, crushing Twitter. Obviously, you have uh, your, you know, you have your venture fund, and you also have 
you're an amazing husband. You're an amazing father. Uh, I hope so. I, well, <laughs> you don't have to hope. ask my wife. <laughs> yeah, Maybe we should get both of you. Yeah. Uh, you know, but is that still the same chatter that goes on in your mind, or has it evolved at all from where you were? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think all this comes down to the standard you set for yourself. I, and I didn't mean it to be negative early on. You know, I, I needed it to be negative because I needed to tell myself that excellence was the standard. Um, and I needed to force that upon myself at first. And so that was, you know, it was negative self-talk in a lot of ways. It was like, look, that's not good enough, you know, telling yourself over and over again. Once that standard is set and it is just implanted in your mind that excellence is the standard that you are going to be going for in anything you do, um, it's much easier then because then you can positive self-talk. You say like, hey, I'm going to dig here because I this is my standard and I know that's my standard. And so I'm going to dig deeper on whatever this is that I'm doing. And that's more positive. That's like a push forward rather than a like self-deprecate to to get there. Um, I, had a, I had a talk with a colleague, a close friend of mine, Wande Olabisi is his name about this. My first job, he started at the same time as me and he was a couple years ahead. And there was some piece of work that we had to do that was like really stupid and kind of annoying. And um, I was kind of going through the motions on it. And he put out this like really great piece of work. And I said to him, man, like, I feel like you really pushed that. And he said, like, if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it well. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that really stuck with me as just a general mentality. Anything you do, if you're going to do it, and you're going to put your name on something, just do it well. Um, and I feel that way about everything I do. I mean, it's like if I'm working out and I'm out for a run or whatever it is, like I'm going to dig a little bit deeper to try to do it well and do it to the standard I feel. As a husband, I want to be an excellent husband. Excellence is the standard. I don't think I always meet that. And by the way, like on all of this stuff, I am so far from perfect. Um, people are like, you know, read the things I read on Twitter and they're like, how do you do all these things? I don't. I'm struggling with the exact same stuff everyone else is. I'm writing about it because that's my process of getting better and of internalizing it and understanding it and wrestling with it. These are all things that I wrestle with the same way as anybody else. Um, but as a husband, I mean, hopefully as a father, as my son grows up, excellence is going to be the standard that I set. I'm never going to settle for anything less than that. Does that mean that I'm not... Um, you know, as stress free all the time. Absolutely. Like that's just the, the life I've chosen, right? Like some people choose to swim downstream. And I think that that's great. And if you're going to be happy from doing that, I think that's fantastic. I'm happier swimming upstream. Um, I just enjoy it more. And that's just how I'm wired. I was having this conversation with my um, podcast co host, Greg, Greg Eisenberg the other day, how he's like a downstream swimmer, and he loves it. Uh, and he's super happy and carefree. Um, and I just said, like, I wouldn't be ha like, I want to swim upstream. I want to feel a little pain. Like I want to go out for a run and feel li like a little bit of pain that I have to grind through. Like, ah, my ankle's not feeling good or my, you know, I'm deadlifting and tweak something. And like, I really like feeling that way where I have to kind of like create an extra gear to get through something. Uh, that's just how I'm wired. And so I think my dad was that way. I don't know if my mom's that way. I think my dad's that way. Um, and so it's just in me. That's just, it's what drives me on a daily basis. I was going to ask, like, where do you think that comes from? Uh, not everyone is wired uh, that way. And it does seem like a very, also like a uh, hyper competitive mindset, not just like competitive with other people, but also competitive with yourself, uh, you know, to enjoy the pain, uh, to push yourself to do things that no one is willing to do, uh, to set yourself uh, to a higher standard. Um, yeah. Does that, is that all, I mean, I'm not going to say all from your dad, but was he kind of like the, the leader in that regard in your household? Yeah. I mean, my mom is a badass. Uh, you know, my, my mom, no one expected much from her. They thought she would stay in India and, um, probably get some sort of arranged marriage. And she basically applied in secret and like, you know, got on a plane, came to America to go to college and had built this amazing life here, built a business. She's amazing. Um, my dad is uh, my dad is like a legitimate psychopath from a work standpoint. Like I've never met anyone that works as hard as he does. And it's because he loves what he does. He really gets a lot of energy out of it until that, you know, he's an academic and he loves his work and his research. And I think until the day he dies, he will want to do that work, which I find amazing and admirable. Um, but he had a chip on his shoulder from a young age, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, his his family situation wasn't great. His dad wasn't the nicest person in the world, didn't want him to marry my mom. Um, and I think he had a lot of kind of built up baggage from that. 
And some people, you know, I think crumble in the face of things and challenges and situations. Some people build up um, a defense mechanism or a shield or something to just grind through it. And I think that that created a chip on his shoulder where he wanted to prove everybody wrong. Mm. And he saw kids doing better than him in school. And he was like, hell no, they're not going to do better than me in school. I'm going to work harder and get there. Um, and that has driven him, I think, at every point in his life. And it continues to today in some way, shape or form to like prove people wrong. Um, I don't know if that is it for me and my, my competition and like my feeling of competitiveness is actually very rarely channeled towards others. Mm. Like I was a competitive baseball player, but I also just enjoyed, um, you know, being around the guys, the other teams. Like I loved seeing other players and learning from them and, you know, hearing about their lives. Like I, I love, I just love people. Um, my competition and where I do that, it's a lot. It's just me. I'm like, hey, I want to throw harder than I did last year when I was playing baseball. And now I'm like, man, I want to grow this to that level. I want to do this because I'm going to get it there. It's not because I'm like, hey, I got to take down that guy. I got to pass this person. I view the world in a very positive some way, to be honest. Sports, you're not really able to do that. It's a zero sum game by definition. You either win uh, or you lose. That's the way it works. Now I'm in a world where I'm like, man, this is very positive sum. I can, if I'm growing, I can help lift other people up. I can help other people grow. Um, if I'm investing in businesses, maybe they're continuing to grow and help other people. It's very positive sum to me. And so my competition is not, I'm going to take that person down to get ahead. My competition is like, I want to get better. I want to grow. I want to be better than I was yesterday. I want to be a better father, better husband, better writer, whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, because that's where I get energy. That's what I enjoy. And that's what makes me feel happy and fulfilled and excited. So you mentioned uh, the dad piece. Uh, so you're a new father. I, Roman is what, like two or three months right now? Six weeks. Six weeks. Oh, gosh. So brand new. Um, yeah. What would you feel is uh, one of the lessons that you would like to impart on uh, Roman? Actually, there's two parts to this question. Uh, one of them is, what do you feel are one of the biggest lessons that you uh, were imparted by your dad? And what were one of the what are one of the lessons that you want to impart to Roman? <clears throat> so there's so many for my dad. I you know I think uh, I think that feeling of of hard work um, and the importance of hard work was probably the, one of the number one things from my dad and also the way that he abstracted that hard work at for me as a kid and what I mean by that is like my dad worked crazy crazy hard I only really saw that when I was older um, because he always managed to be home and have dinner with us every night wow and that is how I want to be like I want to set a standard for my son that hard work is uh, important and that it matters. And there's, you know, there's a meme and there's debates on the internet now of like, um, do you, is, is hard work overrated? And people love saying that. And like, I, look, I don't believe hard work is overrated. Um, I do think that uh, you can get like 90% of the way there by either working smart or working hard. I don't think you can get to 100% without both. Um, and so in my opinion, I want to get the 100%, whatever that is in life, whatever it is I'm doing, I, I want that. Um, and so I'm going to have to work hard and smart. Are there people who can just work smart and like, you know, be lazy and have a great, fulfilling, happy life and that they, sh they should do that? Absolutely. Um, they may never have to work hard. So is hard work overrated? For those people, yeah, it probably is. Um, for me and for the way that I'm wired, absolutely not, because you have to do it in order to create something world changing. Um, and so I think that that was probably the number one for my dad was like, he was always there despite how hard he was working. Um, and I, I love that, love that about him. Um, the other one from both of my parents is, uh, just being there for people when they're going through dark times. Um, I've written about this in the past. I call it darkest hour friends, but call it whatever you want. Um, everyone wants to be there for you when things are good you're celebrating, you got the fundraising round, you sold your company, you got the big win, whatever it is, everyone's around, all your friends are there, people want to toast. And uh, it's fun, it's convenient, it's valuable for them to be associated with you. How many of those people are there when you lose? And when you go bankrupt? And when you're in jail? Uh, or when you're, you know, drunk, and you get in trouble? Very, very few, very, very few. I mean, like, 1% of those people that are there will show up. Um, 
And yet those are the people that matter. And so I, I, I think about my parents as that type of person. Like they, they will be there for people. Uh, I have a few friends like that who I know I could be in the worst situation. They will show up. And they're actually not my best friend in the world in certain cases, but I know they will show up. Um, and those type of people, I think you can count them on one hand and you have to cherish them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, as I think about raising my own son, like I want that to come across to him, the importance of being there for people um, through good times and through bad. Um, that is really, really, really important to me. And then I guess the last one I would say is I view both of my parents as two of the more interested people in the world. And I separate interesting from interested. I think we obsess as a culture uh, on the idea of being interesting. We all want to do these interesting things and we want to get the degrees and we want to have the accolades and the credentials and uh, do some amazing business feat or whatever it is, be interesting. Um, I don't think enough people focus on being interested, Hmm. which means being prone to asking more questions, to being curious, to wanting to go down the rabbit hole, to learn about the people around you, to learn about your environment and the things that you're seeing. Um, Interested people um, are the absolute best. And when you're around someone that's like that, you know it because they are present. They're with you. They're asking follow-up questions. They're really seeing you and understanding you. Um, and I, I strive to be that way. I don't think I always am. I think I am by, by nature interested, but I get grabbed by things and my attention suffers. I'm working on that. But I would love for my son to be you know, interested over interesting that's a, that seems to me like a, a big part of just what is what I feel like a lot of people are missing, which is just like overall curiosity. Um, there, there's this thing on the internet and, and especially social media and Twitter where it's just like, hey, if you want to like, if you actually want to be good, then you have to be an interesting person, right? When the reality is, is that if you actually listen to all the tweets and you read them and you digested them, it, it will actually pop up a lot of really good questions and a lot of really good rabbit holes that, that you want to jump down. Um, and, you know, that being said, I want to talk about this because I, I know I'm taking this in, in a little bit of a different direction. And uh, on the tweet, when I actually posted, uh, you know, I'm talking to Sahil and does anyone have any questions? Uh, your wife uh, popped in. And she, and she's like, ask, ask him about his wonderful wife. Um, yeah, I saw she, she like, she ratioed you on there, she man. She totally ratioed <laughs> me. Just, totally ratioed me. But, but she's like a, what? she's a comment only person on Twitter. She <laughs> only, yeah, just drops like savage comments out of the blue. Comments and and all retweets of of all your stuff. Yeah, of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, also like in another in one of your curiosity chronicles, uh, you talked about the idea between systems versus goals. And to me, from the outside, it obviously seems that you and your wife have this amazing relationship. You have this kind of like pitch and catch with each other. Uh, What would you say is uh, the systems that you take into your own marriage uh, to keep the intimacy alive while you're balancing all this stuff, while you're rearing a a six-year or six-week-old child right now? What are the systems that you guys have to keep yourselves close together? Yeah. Um, the first thing you have to know about my wife is that we grew up together. Um, I met my wife. I was 15 years old. She was 14. Um, on a chorus trip, we were at the UN in New York and I tried to talk to her and she totally blew me off. Uh, you know, like she was the cute freshman. I was like, thought I was a cool sophomore, but I wasn't. Uh, I tried to go talk to her and spit some game or whatever we used to call it back then. And it totally, totally blew, uh, blew me off. And, um, you know, like a few months later, she was dating some guy. A few months later, they broke up and I kind of like slid into, I don't remember what DMs were back then, but it was like (laughs) Facebook messenger or whatever it was. Um, we started talking and, uh, we started dating when, um, it was like May of 2007. Um, and we've been together throughout. Um, and that has four, it's, you know, it never works. Like that type of thing never works. I went away to college. She was going to school on the East Coast, Parsons School of Design. She's a fashion designer. I was going to Stanford, you know, across the country. And I remember us saying like, okay, well, let's try it. And, you know, it's gonna be four years. That doesn't sound that crazy. Let's just try it and see what happens. Um, and I left and four years ended up turning into seven long distance because um, I did my four. I ended up staying and doing a fifth. She was a year behind me in school. Um, 
And then I took a job in California, which none of us had said I was supposed to do. And so four years turned into seven long distance. And what we found was that there was this amazing thing that happened during those years where, um, you know, they say that it kind of like you, you, you grow apart, um, you know, when you have all this time apart. And for us, what it did was that it allowed us to develop our own independent lives mm-hmm. and interest. And that has been so important to who we are as people. I actually think it would have been more challenging, and I don't know what would have happened if we had been in the same place and we had wanted to like hang out every single night and be with each other every single night. Because by being apart, she was able to develop her own friendships and her own life and go out in New York and have fun. And I was able to do the same at Stanford and meet all these amazing people and spend time and focus on our school and focus on our first job when we got there. Um, And there was something so amazing about that that, um, you know, has led to like, infinitely more interesting conversations because we had all these independent experiences over those years. As far as systems and things that, you know, I think we do, I, f- I feel kind of funny, like talking about, um, you know, saying, I, I think we have a wonderful marriage. I like, I admire my wife for so many reasons. I think she's been an amazing wife. I think she's an incredible mother. You know, we're obviously very early in that, but it's been incredible to see her, um, glow and thrive and taking care of this, you know, this young man that we've brought into the world. Um, but I don't know that we do something so unique. We just have this bond and this connection where, you know, when I knew that I wanted to marry my wife, the reason I knew was because I was so happy doing nothing with her. Mm. Um, when I was young, I always assumed that love and that life was like the oh, amazing vacations and the hotel stays and the beautiful dinners out and the, you know, all of these like glamorous things. And the reality is that like 99% of life is sitting around doing nothing. And so if you are in love with the person and you love just sitting around doing nothing, that is your one. Like that person is here to stay in your life. Um, and I see it even more now, right? Like we don't go out. We, we have a six week old. Like we're not going out in New York, going and having fun things. We're not going to Greece this summer. Like all of my friends, like I got invited on this yacht trip in San Tropez with some friends recently. I was like, dude, I can't do that. You know, I was six week old at home, but I'm so happy. And like we go for a walk every morning together with our son and we don't talk, you know, like we're, we're together all day. It's not like we're having some, um, you know, life changing conversation every time we're together. Mm. But just enjoying being present and being with someone um, and having that type of relationship, I just think is it's it's been so important to us um, and to who we were. I love that. Um, it reminds me of uh, myself and my wife. Actually, like right before this, uh, you know, shout out to your wife and shout out to my wife. Like my microphone wasn't working and she she had or actually we had our, our daughter Koa you know, off at a grandma's, she went off and went to Best Buy, got me a new mic, brought it mm. over here. And, you know, why wifeys don't really get the respect that, that they should, you know, um, especially when they turn into mothers, like the way that they blossom when they go into motherhood is just an incredible thing to watch. Uh, so I want to, I want to ask you now, you have all these things going on in your life, you're striving to be the best uh, parent and the best husband that you can be. What are, how do you balance it all? You know, cause, cause I know some people just, they overreach on some things, right? They may overreach on the work. Actually the work piece is like the most comfortable thing to overreach on. In your case, like how do you balance everything to kind of like keep all these plates spinning and to keep yourself at a hundred with each and every one of the things that mean something to you? Yeah, I mean, my number one thing recently and over the last year, it's become really core is I just take on less. Um, I've gotten really good at just saying no to things and, um, you know, basically just like saying no to anything I don't really deeply want to do. Um, I used to be the person that would like say yes to everything. I'd go to every dinner. Um, I'd go to every wedding. I'd like every single thing I got invited to, whether or not I like really wanted to go. And then I would feel stretched and I would feel stressed and it was, you know, created challenges in other areas of my life. It's like, you only have so much to give. And so when that happens, you get like, you know, pulled in different directions, something has to give. Um, And if that something has to give is your wife or, you know, your relationship with your wife or your relationship with your kid, I'm not cool with that. Mm. Um, And so today, you know, like my general razor, like my way of thinking about these things is if I'm going to take on something new, 
like a project or whatever it might be, I assume I flip the switch in my head and I assume that it is going to take twice as long as I think and it's going to be half as profitable as I think. And if I still want to do it, then I know it's a no-brainer and I have to go dive into it. But if I if that gives me any sort of pause, I'm like, oh, well, that's a long time or that's not enough money to do it, um, then I'm just, it's, it's a no. Mm. And I immediately say no. Um, the other one I've seen which has worked for me is like, write down the 20 priorities in your life, um, pick the 10 that are the biggest priorities off that list, and then strike out seven of them. And the three that are left are the things that actually matter. Mm. Um, and those type of you know mechanics for thinking through what to really take on really helps you prioritize your time um, much more effectively. I, I mean, I've had periods of my life where I just had way too much on my plate. And I think today, the external perception of the amount that I have on my plate um, is probably uh, is probably higher than how I feel because I've done a really good job of like building systems and and um, you know and delegating certain things. I have you know team members in a few areas on like more back off you know like operational things that I don't have to run. Then mm. um, I still write every single thing that I put out. I've never hired a writer. I've never had you know a freelancer do any writing for me, and that's because that's what I enjoy most. I write every single day. I mean, I love that. And so I never, I honestly won't, um, ha have someone with my name on it, you know, someone else writing something. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's my general rule of thumb is like, you just have to find more ways to say no and make sure you're getting leverage on the things you are doing. Um, otherwise things are going to slip. Um, and you need to then figure out like, what do you really care about? What what does make you happy? What does give you energy? And how are you going to prioritize? I'm actually sharing in my newsletter, you know, a, a, a simple framework that I used for my calendar, which I found really helpful. I, I call it like an energy calendar, mm -hmm. where um, after a day, uh, I would color code my calendar, and I'd put green for anything that I felt like created energy, yellow for if it was neutral, and then red if it really drained me. I love that. Um, and at the end of a week, you get a pretty good sense for like the activities that are creating energy um, and the activities that are draining it. And then you can go and say like, okay, I'm going to prioritize and amplify the greens. I'm going to try to delegate or delete any of those red things. Um, and then the yellows, you know, we could figure out it's neutral. Maybe I have to do them or maybe I can delegate them. But the whole idea is like, how do I get my calendar to look um, really green and like the highest green to red ratio that you can possibly have. Um, and as you see it and it becomes like a trigger in your mind where you're looking at it and you, you're feeling it, um, it forces you in that direction towards much more green over time. That's beautiful. And that was really helpful for me when I started doing that. So, so what would you say are like your utmost green activities at this very moment? And what would you say are the red activities that are in your schedule that you would like to delegate or get away from? Um, green activities, reading, writing, um, like focused reading, writing periods, um, working out. I like complete, I mean, it's, it's a, um, it's a must in my, in my schedule every day. My wife is a saint, you know, she, and she does too. Actually, we just bought a tonal, which she loves. And I think it's a really fun thing too. Um, so I'll take Roman for an hour and make sure to protect that time for her. Um, but likewise, like I need an hour and a half a day aware of, of physical activity. Otherwise I'm not happy. Like it impacts my happiness levels. Um, so those three, um, and then I really like reviewing, um, company opportunities, like investment mm -hmm. opportunities, uh, mostly because I really like learning about new companies and new, new ideas and what things people are doing. And then the last one is recording podcasts. Absolutely love getting a chance to talk to these smart people that are doing cool things. Um, red activities. I hate like, you know, get to know you zoom calls. Um, calls you know just like calls with no action items like there's no purpose to them i will do that in person till kingdom come i love meeting people face to face like i it when people email me now asking for a call I'll say like let me know when you're in new york would love to host you at my club we'll get together absolutely love to do that it's not like a it's not a time thing i just get negative uh utility out of zoom calls because what ends up happening is i'm sitting there and i'm you know stressed about something else or not paying attention and um, you're not really developing an emotional connection with the person. You can't really like dive in on things. It's 30 minutes. Um, and so I just, um, I hate that. And so I'm trying my best to just scrub all kind of like mindless calls out of my calendar and do all of that in person. I mean, I had a kid, um, the other day I was out having drinks with a friend. This is funny to me that this happens now, but I was having drinks with a, with an old baseball teammate from Stanford actually. Um, 
and a young man came up to me and was like, oh, are you Sahil? I follow you on Twitter. Uh, this is like in New York and Tribeca. And I said, you know, I said, yeah, it's like still hilarious to me that that <laughs> happens now um, uh, in, in certain instances. But I talked to him and then I basically like I hit him up later, like he wanted some career advice and I hit him up later and we scheduled to get together. And so we're getting together on Tuesday at my club for an hour and I'm going to sit down and like we're going to hang out and talk. And it, and it was like, I'm so happy to do that. But I, I mean, I would rather do anything than do that, do that same call over the phone. Nice. OK, you mentioned this club. What is this club that you're talking about? Um, I'm a member at this place called Core Club um, in Midtown. It's like, you know, New York has these. I was never really familiar with it in the Bay Area because the Bay Area is more of like a golf club culture. I think the East Coast is, too. But New York City has these like I call them social clubs. It, this is like Core Club has, you know, a uh, fitness facility, sauna, steam room, showers, like a restaurant, bar. Um, but it's a great place to host people, you can, you know, have drinks, snacks, food, whatever. Um, and I, it's, it's really what I use as like my home base out of the city. Um, cause I don't have an office in the city. We live in Westchester. Um, so I'll go in when I'm going to spend a day there and I'll just, you know, have people for coffee or drinks or lunch and then go have dinner somewhere. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to meet you there. And, yeah, please do. Yeah, check you out there. Please do. Awesome. When are you going to be in New York? Hit me up, man. Let uh, me know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Not, not I would love to, it, but uh, but definitely. Now that you mention it, uh, I got some people to see, and uh, you're at the top of the list, my friend. Ah, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, one actually, not the last question. I got some rapid fire ones, but this one has actually been, uh, just kind of keeping me up at night because uh, when you wrote this on Twitter, I was like, God damn it, that's one of the best ideas I've ever heard in my entire life. So. <laughs> For the best, for the past twenty five years, you've been writing to yourself. You've been writing a letter to yourself on your birthday. So you're thirty two mm -hmm. years old right now. And when you when you're doing this writing process, you're actually making these predictions as well. And I know, mm -hmm. like during the Twitter process, you're like, well, most of the predictions didn't come true. But is there any wild predictions that that actually did come true as a result of you writing to yourself on your birthday? Well. The first one, uh, the first, like the genesis of me writing letters to my future self. So um, this was basically an idea that I had starting in eighth grade, because in eighth grade, they forced our entire class to write letters to our like high school graduate self, and then they were going to deliver it to us. Um, really, the only prediction I've ever gotten right was in that first letter. Um, and it was <laughs> hilarious when I opened it because I opened this letter, you know, I just graduated. It was like the summer after my senior year of high school, opened this letter that I didn't remember writing. It's filled with a bunch of like immature, stupid, you know, eighth grade jokes that I made and a bunch of drawings. But in it, I literally said, um, I would like to play baseball at either Rice or Stanford. Yeah. Um, wow. And like, holy hell, you know, I had no business saying that as an eighth grader. I didn't remember saying it. I didn't remember that being a goal, but I said it. Um, and there I was, you know, with a scholarship in hand five years, four years later, going to Stanford to play baseball. Um, so that was probably the only one I've ever gotten right. My other ones like, you know, uh, so now I do this, which what you're alluding to, I started doing it again on my 25th birthday. So um, I've now opened two. Um, I'm 31. So I opened the first one on my 30th birthday, the second one on my th um, uh, 31st birthday, because uh, I send them to myself five years in the future. I've most of them are stupid predictions, like, I'll, you know, oh, we're gonna like land a person on Mars, or, you know, I think we're gonna, um, you know, have someone on the moon, I had one that was like World War Three will have already started, which oh, no. you could argue, maybe that's correct, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been most uh, honestly, I use that section to like say stupid things. The biggest takeaway from all of this has been the goal setting exercise, like the five year plan is a useless thing. Um, everyone wants to set five year plans. And what I've noticed from reading from writing and then reading these letters is I was always dramatically off in what I thought I was going to be doing in five years. Um, and it's just because it's so hard to predict, especially at that age, like when you're 20, 25, 30, your life changes so ridiculously in five years. Like I think about, you know, from 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, my life was completely different in five year increments. Once you're 40, maybe it starts to be like, you kind of know where you'll be in five years and you can plan more. Um, but early on the five year planning thing is just a false narrative, I think. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we're going to go into some rapid fire questions right now. All right. This is, uh, this has been amazing. And, uh, I've been taking notes. Um, 
I love podcasting because you just get to talk to some geniuses. It's totally. Yeah. I'm not a genius, but yeah, I agree. It's fun getting to talk to new people. You're a very humble man, Sahil. Very humble, and I, and I love that about you. Um, okay, first uh, rapid fire question: What's the best prank you ever pulled on someone? <laughs> <laughs> this is good um baseball locker room uh 2012 at stanford um uh, f- f- uh one of my teammates this guy kenny de kroger who i have to name because this is just hilarious um i told i i basically went through the baseball office and communicated to him that um college game day was in town for a stanford football game and we told him that Aaron Andrews wanted to interview him as part of like a preseason special for baseball because she was doing the um, college baseball at the time. And it was totally ridiculous, but he was kind of high on himself and uh, he believed it. And we had him show up to the locker room in a full suit and tie um, for this interview. And he showed up and the whole team was waiting there to like punk him when he walked in. And it was I, that was like one of the highlights of my years at Stanford for sure. Amazing. <laughs> Cruel, but amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. If you were to write a book on any topic of the world or in your life, what would it be? This might actually happen. So I, I'm probably not going to reveal what the, uh, <laughs> what the topic is going to be. Unfortunately, okay. I'm going to pass on this one. Okay. No worries. No worries. What's the last movie the, uh, that made you emotional or cry? Ooh. Oh. Um, probably The Adam Project, which is a random one. Hmm. So uh, Ryan Reynolds... Um, I think it's on Netflix or Apple TV. Um, It's one of his like kind of corny movies. It's like a time traveler uh, type story. Um, It made me emotional because it has this um, whole narrative around time and with your relationships with your father and son. Um, And there's this scene at the end of it where um, the like the son, the kind of kid, um, his dad, and then the future version of the son are all playing catch together. And it's this like, a beautiful kind of introspective thing on time and your relationship with your father. And it made me very um, emotional around like playing catch with my own dad and now hopefully getting to do that with my son as he gets older. I saw the picture of the the three generations of blooms. Uh, oh, that was so special, that was man. Amazing. That's amazing. And isn't it like kind of, isn't it kind of uh, surreal uh, to, to have the grandfather yourself and the son and then to see the son interact with the grandmother and to, to have this like, uh. intergenerational Kind of like, it's the best thing in the world, man. It's I um, I it's completely indescribable. I mean, the feeling of of having a child is completely indescribable. Um, the the connection that you feel, and for your parents, I mean, for my parents, I always wondered for so many years, like, mom, stop embarrassing me. Why are you so emotional <laughs> at every life event? And now I get it. Mm. Like, I'm gonna be emotional at every. You know, my kid like rolls over, and I'm sitting here crying. <laughs> yeah, it's like these big life moments that you think about that they're not gonna really, you know, consider as being big. Okay, three things people believe today but are completely wrong in your eyes. Oof. Oh, man. Um, hard work is not overrated. Um, what are two more? I, t- I mean, like, I think people's relationship with time is massively misrepresented. I think we don't appreciate just how little time we have with mm. people that we care about. Um and I think that doing that math actually will make you make a lot of different decisions about life. Um, and then the last one, I guess I would say is like, you have to ask for things. Good things don't just happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people assume that like, if you put in work, you know, you put, make sacrifices, whatever, that good things just happen. Um, and I think most of the time you have to push, like you have to ask, you have to, you know, it's like closed mouths don't get fed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of them was just asking you for, to get on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, shit, this guy's got like, you know, a, a million Twitter followers, probably not going to see his DM. And I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to do it anyways. And then uh, and then you replied back. I'm like, holy shit, it's actually happening. Here we go. Okay. I still do look at all my DMs. I get a lot of like, you know, mean DMs now, uh, oh, no. you know, just like at scale, which always surprises me because I don't really think I'm putting out anything that's particularly abrasive. But um, but yeah, um, I, I still do look at all my DMs. I just can't reply to I get get too many of them now. Yeah, uh, sometimes the DMs could be a mess, especially on Twitter. And, uh, yeah. and the bigger you go, the more weirder people you just kind of attract in general. So 100%. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing that you preach in your Twitter threads, but actually struggle the most to do yourself. Oh, I mean, all of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, like, yeah. Uh, one thing, let's see. I, I mean, I think the time, like, um, 
you know, being ruthless about your time, I still struggle with for sure. I mentioned that earlier. Like I think, um, saying no to things I'm still just bad at. I'm like a, I'm a happy, I hope this comes across to people. Like I'm a happy, very positive person. Um, even when people shit talk me on Twitter or like say negative things to me, like I generally respond positively, um, or I just don't respond, but like generally speaking, I'm just a happy guy. And so I like to say yes to things and I'm bad at being like, the negative, you know, I, I'm a people pleaser in a lot of ways. And so, um, saying no and learning to say no to people is very difficult for me. It's easy for me to say no to like taking on a project in the abstract, but when people reach out to me and ask and they're genuine, I have a really tough time with that still. And so I'm still working through slowly, like getting my calendar and kind of prioritizing my time. And the kid helps with that, honestly, um, just as like a fail safe excuse, like, Hey, no, that's when I spend time with him. And, um, that it works. And that kind of gives me a thing that I can, I can kick it to (laughs) myself and my wife. Uh, I mean, we, we, uh, used to go out a lot, but now we're just like, you know, super family, uh, driven right now. And we use the kid as an excuse to, to not go out, uh, literally or just, no, no, sorry. We're we're just going to be with the kid, you know? And I think it's the best. Yes. Like I, I, (laughs) the moments of my last year, um, you know, I had a moment, I wrote about it recently. Like I had this moment, um, I was out on a walk, but well, I was actually, my wife wasn't actually there with me. I was out on a walk. I had him in the like little kangaroo pack. Um, I was trying to let her sleep. It was like, you know, a week after he was born and I was out walking, he was asleep on my chest. I didn't have my phone on me. Um, and I had a coffee and it was warm and it was like 75 and sunny. And I was just standing there and I was like, life does not get better than this moment. And I don't have anything right now. It's not like I'm rich and I'm on a yacht or I'm on a private jet or I'm on a vacation. I was like in my neighborhood. It was sunny outside. Um, And I really felt like that was the first moment in my life where I really felt like I had enough and that I didn't need anything more to be happy um, the rest of my life. And that was such a profound feeling. And I just want to bottle that up. Um, and I want to continue to feel that way. Yeah. All the other stuff is just bonus, uh, to be quite honest, they're just bonuses, uh, it is really the relationship that you have with your wife and your, uh, son and also your parents. Uh, that's where you get the most juice and most fulfillment. Um, totally get that. Okay. Uh, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? <laughs> now or before? <laughs> I'll, I'll say before uh, yeah. And after. Um, do before and after maybe. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty, so like in my private equity days, uh, you know, early on, I was like a, you know, four to six hours a night. Wow. Like I'd go to bed at 10 and wake up. Yeah. I was, I was big on waking up at like three forty-five for many years. That was kind of my, my hour when I'd get up. And so I did not get enough sleep and I really was like hustle culture to the max. <laughs> um, I then, you know, like COVID hit, I started taking health more seriously around, like I was getting older. I was starting to feel a little banged up. Um, and then I was pretty ruthless about like seven to eight hours and really eight hours plus, Mm. um, and got really good about that. My wife and I are both early to bed, early to rise types, which helps. Um, and so I was like for a long time, very good. I would have to check my aura stats now. You know, I actually think I sleep probably a similar amount, but I have the like wake ups, you know, like, you know, he's crying in the middle of the night and, you know, needs to eat or whatever it is. My wife is a saint and she like handles all of the, you know, during the night stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it can't be more than like six hours of good sleep right now. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. I heard on the, the pump podcast that your sleeping habits were just ridiculously bad. Um, on yeah. The, yeah, I was just like, Oh God. Like, yeah, I used to, um, I used to really punish myself, man. Yeah. Um, and I took pride in it. It was like a, um, you know, it was a thing that I really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, I liked waking up and feeling like crappy and not sleeping a lot and waking up early, but like you, you get older and you get a little wiser about what that means for your long-term health, I think. Hell yeah. Okay. So, uh, motivational track that you listen to on a regular basis. I don't listen to motivational stuff anymore. Okay. Um, I did a lot during my baseball days. And I loved like Ray Lewis. I loved it. I mean, if I were to listen to one, if you were like, hey, go listen to something to fire you up, yeah. I'd go pull up one of like Eric Thomas's, uh, is that his name? The hip hop preacher guy. So. I'd go listen to one of his um, tracks. Like he has this one um, where he like, I think it was at NC State football that he gives that I just think is, it fires me up. It's awesome. Nice. Um, but yeah, I like that stuff. All right. And what's it like to have the best hair on Twitter? <laughs> I say as I'm wearing a hat, <laughs> yeah, your hair looks no, better than mine. I'm, I'm so disappointed. Uh, oh man, you know, years and years of work, hours and hours of work <laughs> every day. No, I mean, I had a buzz cut for many years, man. And then I, I grew it out uh, my last year in college and 
uh, the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And then the last one, uh, where can people find you and uh, what exactly are you working on that's, uh, that's exciting that you can uh, point people to? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm at Sahil Bloom on Twitter. Um, my website's sahilbloom.com. Um, you can find my newsletter there, podcast there. Um, everything kind of routes through that central nervous system. I will be releasing, you know, everything new through there. Um, probably going to roll out a community here soon so that, you know, people like-minded kind of growth oriented people can kind of come together, interact. I'll be in there and spending time with people. Um, and, uh, have always been looking for a way to kind of go deeper with the, like, you know, the core, the core people who really want to. So excited about that. And, uh, you know, just hope everyone has an awesome summer. I'm around, my DMs are open. Would love to hear from more people. Um, and just look forward to continuing to build. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, one thing I would say if, uh, for anyone listening is to join his newsletter, the curiosity Chronicle. Uh, I, I man, I, that's one of the newsletters I just read on a regular basis. Uh, yours, uh, Farnham street, uh, James clear, as well and uh you just have like just amazing goodies in there every single week so highly recommend you to join the newsletter and i will be joining the community when you come out with it uh super super looking forward to joining that too um so sahil uh dude thank you so much for uh, jumping on the podcast really appreciate it really appreciate you and uh and yeah man um at some point, maybe when the baby gets older, we'll talk about uh, parenting lessons and, and all that. I ah, can't wait. Yeah, amazing. Can't wait. 